Greetings from Hong Kong, everybody. Hope everyone is safe and healthy. To our audience, we say thank you all for joining us again time after time. In a moment, we're going to introduce the brand new look and feel of the just released Marantz 30 series. And the two new stars of the month are the Model 30 Integrated Amp and the SACD30N Streaming CD and SACD player. And our host today is our training guru, Phil, and he joins us from Carlsbad from his fancy dungeon. Can I say that, Phil? Dungeon? <laughs> the dungeon. So today, we're going to be talking about Marantz's new Model 30 series, which continues the Marantz legacy of sound and also kind of shows you their new kind of design direction. And then also talk about what's inside of the box and why we believe these are some spectacular um, audio devices. So Marantz, of course, was started um, in the in 1951. Basically, he was in his basement. Saul, Saul was in his basement, and he and he was building his own amplifier because he was just not happy with the, uh, his own audio equipment because he just was not happy with the performance of what was available on the market. So he, of course, he started making his own pieces, and people were um, loved the way they sound, and started asking him to make pieces for them. And lo and behold. Um, it became a business. So we've all, it's always been a legacy of sound. It's always been about the best quality sound possible, music first type of a philosophy. So it's always been about the great, great performing hi-fi. Now, over the years, there's been some amazing products released from Marantz. And a lot of these products, Jim always mentions, are probably are, are coveted and probably worth more now than they were when they were actually release, but they've had a, a heritage of building great sounding products, but they've always, always looked good and they've always sounded good. And there was some unique characteristics that always called out that it was a Marantz. So if you look at the Model 9, the, um, the pro uh, in the 1960, the Project T1 in uh, 1995, and even the PM10, you could see that there's a port that porthole, which has kind of became the uh, a signature of the brand. So there's certain things about the brand that calls out that it is Marantz. People buy Marantz because um, there's a pride of ownership. So whenever I walk around with my Marantz T-shirt on, people always comment about Marantz. They they talk about the fact that they um, that they that their dad used to have it or that they have it and how much they love the brand. People are proud of owning this brand and they're very connected to it. So we want to make sure we maintain that brand um, signature when it comes to appearance and sound, uh, but also modernize it and add all of the modern features that you need when you are listening to um, where the ways we get music today, like digital. So keep the look and, and also make sure that it sounds perfect. So we were lucky enough at Sound United to acquire Marantz in uh, 2017. And we are determined to, to continue the legacy of the way it looks and, of course, the way it sounds. So um, each brand, like as we always mention, all has a sound master and his team. And they work diligently in Japan to ensure that all Marantz products sound like Marantz's. They work, these, these gentlemen have, have spent their entire life literally listening to these products apprentice, as, as apprentices or as actual sound tuners. And then they will pass that heritage on to the next sound master when they retire. So every product after it is designed must pass the sonic quality tests of our sound masters. And this guarantees that that warm Marantz sound that people love continues on. I'd like to introduce Simon. Simon is our head of design. This is his baby. He helped design, the, he designed this product and he could really go in and talk about um, why it looks like it does and why we're taking this direction. So, so Simon, why don't you explain what the idea and some of the design characteristics of the product for um, this beautiful group of people? Yeah, I think the key here was, as um, Phil was saying, honoring the, the history of the um, heritage of the brand, but moving the brand forward at the same time. So um, we didn't want to just come up with a retro design, which is very much in vogue. We wanted to build on the heritage of the brand and pick up on the elements that we felt were very strong. Um, mm -hmm. I think Phil and I have been very privileged that we can spend a lot of time around these devices and actually spend a lot of time in the museum with you know all the beautiful old classic products we have 
you know, 70 years of history to, to build upon and build towards this new future. And there were key elements that we picked up, which is a lot of the symmetry that we saw in the early products. But one of the key things as well was there was a level of indulgence and richness in materials throughout the history of the product. We wanted to keep that there. Um, very much designers like to focus on, you know, form follows function. Um, but some things have, they elevate above that as well. I mean, I, I often use the analogy that a Volkswagen will get you from A to B just as well as the Bentley, but the Bentley has a very different experience. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, some of the elements we picked up when we've seen some of the shots is we've always had this like interplay of light and form, which is something we wanted to pick up with Marantz. We spent a lot of time tuning those um, LEDs to have that same warm glow that you might have got from your um, tube valve amps. We have, as, as Phil talked about, this absolute rigorous focus on symmetry and alignment. So everything is aligned beautifully. Easy to say, harder to do in real life when you're arguing with a mechanical engineer about saving two cents on the board height of where you can put a knob. We put a lot of effort into the materials, the aluminum we're using, uh, the weighting and the balance of, of all the controls is actually very important. And you know, really um, coming back to these key, what we think almost like DNA elements of the brand, you know, the, the Marantz logo through history, and I, I love, you know, Phil talking about t-shirt, I have the same experience when I have mine, the, you know, the primacy of the logo in the designs, to put it front and center, to not adorn it with other model names or anything else, to really treat that with reverence is one of the key factors. The porthole, um, we all love the porthole, we need to give it new utility and new flexibility as it moves forward into the future, so we're spending time thinking about how the porthole evolves into the digital realm, um, how that element will become. But it's a key signature element of the brand that we feel um, you know, everybody looks for uh, from the very VU meters. So you know, really that's, you're seeing the key elements there, the key detailing and the sort of richness of the design that we focus on. And this is really a foundation for the Model 30 is the foundation for uh, this new sort of generation of design language. So if you think about family history, there are different generations that bring their own unique features, but still have um, a synergy and a DNA that sort of reach back into the past. One thing too, that I want to point out, he talks about symmetry and and this luxury, um, the, the metals, the touch, the feel. One of the things that you touch all the time is the remote control. And this is literally one of the most beautiful remotes I have ever had in my hand. Um, it's, it has a metal, it's metal, it has a weight to it. It's a joy to hold this because 90% of the time, this is the way you're going to be interacting with your products. And, this, and both the, the SA CD player and the um, integrated amplifier come with the same remote. So I love this remote, Simon, A+. Plus, yeah, I'll just add to that, Phil. You mentioned the color. I forgot to mention that is the... All these colors are a unique blend for, for Marantz. Um, we talk about the bronzy sort of fleck that we have, the sort of richer color that we've created ourselves, mm -hmm. both for the champagne uh, silver color and this black color. They're both warm. They both respond to that um, uh, that sort of rich feeling that, that Phil's talking about there. Um, <laughs> on the remote, we still quite haven't solved the diving between the cushions problem on the sofa, but I think uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's big enough to find, I think is the key. It's a great, great, great. Um, remote control it just it just shows the character and all of the care they took from every aspect of the design from the beginning to the end um, they did a they did a they did a spectacular job now now another question Simon all if people ask is we all of the lights you went to this warmer color um, almost like two or last re, last time you were joking that it's kind of like your the color of your favorite bourbon what yeah. happened to the blue what happened to the blue the blue you know. Yeah, the, yeah, the blue is something we play with. For a while, we had um, sort of switchable mode. We were thinking about we could actually switch between this sort of new warm classic and the traditional blue. The problem with blue is when when Marantz first adopted the blue and we used the blue, it was actually a a very premium color and, and hard to come by, especially with LEDs. They were very expensive. Since blue became popular and popularized by some other brands, everybody in the um, consumer electronics world has sort of run towards it and now we see it uh, very cheapened and the association with that blue seems to be um, uh, somewhat negative so mm -hmm. something we could certainly revisit in the past because we, we're very well aware that blue is part of the heritage there's so much rich heritage in Marantz it's it's um, we don't necessarily just make it a smorgasbord of you know elements so 
we've had to edit down and, and we'll, we'll revisit that in the future, certainly. But for now, it just seemed to, I would say, cheapen these products, especially in comparison to others. So um, it's something that you know, wasn't made, decision made lightly, and it's something we're still considering. This glow, it, it does have kind of that warm tube type thing. And it, it's just beautiful to look at as, as music is actually playing. So it is, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous design. So, so okay. what about the front, uh, front face, et cetera, et cetera? Simon, you want to weigh in? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the knobs and the, the sort of front control panel are all aluminum. Um, they are a, a, a high grade aluminum. I can't remember if it's 6062, but um, high grade aluminum. Um, the panel behind it, uh, we originally had that in uh, machined aluminum, but often we have to make some decisions based on uh, how material performs. And we have to obviously sometimes dampen resonance and other things and that to use isolation. So that's actually a polymer, but that's then painted in a very really sort of high quality uh, finish uh, with that metallic fleck in there as well. So that, um, and that's there to have that interplay with the light and the form um, there. So that's the, the, um, the side parts, the chassis, one of the unique things. And I'm actually glad he asked the question. It's a great question. The um, side panels are aluminum. We can see we spent a lot of effort actually um, assuring that screws and other bosses weren't visible from the outside. So you'll see on, um, I would say, sort of lower cost uh, pro products, you'll have screws and bosses sort of showing on the sides and the top of the product. All those have been, um, you know, beautifully hidden away in the way that this form comes together. Um, I think the top panel may be steel. I uh, can't remember. It's been through a couple of iterations <laughs> in the it process. It feels like it's steel. Yeah, it's those tough. are all on the side. Yeah, yeah. so it's true. Yeah. yeah, and like I said, it, and it, it, that's another attention to detail, the fact that there is no, there's oh, literally realized. no screen Sorry, along Phil. the side. It's actually amazing. Sorry, Phil. I just realized I can say aluminium now. Aluminium. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, yeah, so. We're well, international team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. We, we're using aluminium, everybody. <laughs> hey, yes, uh, Simon. <laughs> we have another question. Ashley. Oh, man. Uh, so this is Jim. I'm back butchering people's names all over the globe. <laughs> Ashley D. Ocampo uh, wants to yeah. know why the golf ball look. Oh, yeah. This one's gone. This was actually picked up from, um, it's a, a reference to some of the uh, earlier products that had some imagery in there. So we had, if you look at some of the older models, they had a uh, mesh in them and holes in the back. And there was also some of the symbolism around the star in the, excuse me, my cat's trying to join the conference call. Uh, I put that down on the floor. Um, that was to sort of reference the, the symbolism around how sound was um, emanating from the device as well. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's it's purely decorative. It has no function. Um, and it's one of these things we just sort of adds to that warmth and that luxury feeling of the product very much. As we described before, if you uh, you know, your Volkswagen have a very pure, clean look on the interior, your your Bentley has a sort of richer, more opulent uh, finish, but still has that same level of functionality. Um, yeah, like the wood grains you see, the really like the zebra woods and the and this yeah, there's like a a texture or a feel to it that when you touch it, it just it, it's, it's a model. It's, yeah. yeah, it's just it makes you kind of want to just touch it for um when you first when you first see it because it is yeah, it, it feels is, really good to the hand. It's something yeah. we may be playing up and down on different models going forward. Um, but, you know, like I said, there's a lot of elements we've used and had to put to the side, like the like the star, for instance, the the the, the beautiful red star now becomes a digital element um, primarily on devices and we're not using that physically so mm -hmm. yeah. there are things we're having to play with phil one last comment i'd like to have on design is mm -hmm. every new generation of what we call a design language you know mm -hmm. takes a while to get used to right we all sort of have to sometimes you know, let go of the past and embrace the new mm -hmm. you see it in like generations of bmws or other cars right <laughs> sort of everyone mm -hmm. loves how it is and then the new the new models the new generation comes out and like, oh, i'm not so sure and then all of a sudden you you know by the time you get to get rid of that design language, everyone loves it. <laughs> so it's sort of a, an evolutionary phase. But this is kind of the design um, language we're going to continue with going going forward. The, the new theme for Morantz is modern musical luxury. Each brand has to have kind of a mantra, something to go by. And, and this is kind of when, as they design the product inside and out, is what they're thinking about. Um, this is the goal. So let's talk about this real quick. So the first thing, 
it's got to be modern. It has to be able to be, there's a lot, um, when Marantz first came out, there was limited sources to use, maybe a, a turntable, maybe a reel-to-reel. Now there's tons of sources that people utilize. So whether it's a turntable, <laughs> believe it or not, a record player, a turntable, a, uh, a, a reel-to-reel, a streaming music, this, USB, PC music, all of that stuff needs to be incorporated. So it needs to be modern. And not only does it have to be, be able to play modern sources, it has to fit into the modern home. It has to blend in while maintaining that signature Marantz look. So whether you have a home with classic finishings or a, ho a home with modern finishings, you want this product to blend in. And you, uh, so that's incredibly important. The next thing is it needs to be, of course, musical. It needs to sound like a Marantz. It needs to deliver that Marantz sound because that, number one, is the main reason why you buy Marantz. Yes, it's pretty, but the main thing that you're buying it for is to listen to it. So it needs to maintain Marantz's musical character. And then finally, we, had our, we just talked about the fact that this is a brand that people are proud to own. That we run around with our t-shirts you guys are always asking me can i get can i get one of those t-shirts people run around asking they love the t-shirts they love the brand they they keep products for years because it's a luxury item a luxury item is something that you covet and that other people aspire to own and that's another thing that we must 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 also maintain so these new models are the first models that um, kind of follow this entire philosophy from beginning to end. Because, and like we said, it's always, always first about the music. But like I said, the cosmetics stand out. They look different than what other Marantz pieces look like. So we have to uh, talk about that as well. So these are the two models we're gonna be talking about. The, um, we call them together the Model 30 series, but there is a SACD um, slash CD player called the CD model, um, CD30N. And then there is the integrated um, amplifier slash preamplifier labeled the model 30. And they are available in both the, um, the black that I have behind me, as well as this, um, I guess it's a silverish champagne finish, which I am very excited about. This will be the first time in a long time in the US that we actually get both colors so we're we have access to both the black and the sh and this um, warm champagne color normally these um, lighter colors are only available in asia and europe and we have been screaming for them in the us and and in canada for a while and now we will actually get access to it so so we want to now talk a little bit about what's inside the box so let's go in and talk about the particular the, the details inside of the particular boxes now all right I'm a music first kind of person. I want it to look good, but it has to sound good. And these sound absolutely great. So let's go in and talk first about the Model 30 integrated amplifier. So this is the unit that we have here. As you can see, it's a, it has that very symmetrical, um, um, symm it has that very the symmetry and the porthole and all the design language in, that's in it. But there are some unique things about it that we definitely want to cover. The first, um, first thing. It is literally a power amp and preamplifier. It's two products in one box. It has two different power supplies, one for the preamp section, one for the power amp section. So if you want to use this as a preamp um, in the future or to also drive another amplifier, maybe to buy amp something, it is a, it is a very, very good preamp as well as a good integrate, a great integrated amp. The preamp also has a very good phono stage, which, which has um, uh, a moving coil and moving magnet capabilities with three uh, um, selectable um, input impedances because different moving magnet cartridges have different impedances, and this allows you to closer um, align the performance with the cartridge that you have. Um, the, phono, the phono stage also utilizes HDAMs in it to maintain, which it, like we talked about, we always talk about hyperdynamic amplifier modules. So instead of utilizing off the shelf op amps to boost signal, we um, build our own amplifier modules um, piece by piece by piece. Um, and that, uh, and how that, so that allows the sound masters and the sound tuning team to ensure that that phono pre-stage sounds has that Marantz character and warmth. And um, so, so even the phono pre-stage has the phono 
amp stage has a has these HDAMs in it. Okay, um, it's a DC couple volume stage, very good volume stage, and it it, it is a fully discrete preamplifier. Um, the the Amplifier itself uses is a um, has um, uses a switching power supply similar to the Ki Ruby and the PM10, and which allows it to provide a great amount of output for its compact size. So, and it's 100 watts in per channel into 8 ohms and 200 watts into 4 ohms. So, you can easily drive a a nice set of bookshelves like my my Legend L200s or a larger pair of floor standards like even a pair of I think this this system with a pair of with, with a pair of demand D15s or D17s would be absolutely outstanding and of course passionately tuned by the Morant Soundmaster to ensure that that even though that while we changed we evolved the appearance the sound still maintains that Morant's character so here is the back of the unit you'll see that it is a preamp so right in Right here, you'll see these kind of couple of the inputs have this kind of a uh, decorative detail to it. So if you want to use this as a pre-out, and you want to, it's a very high-end, high-quality variable pre-out. That if you want to drive a secondary amplifier um, with it, or eventually say you buy a bigger amp and you want to utilize this as a preamp, you can do that. And the next thing is, it has Jim's um, one of Jim's favorite features on it, which is called power amp direct but you'll see it here called the power app the power app input and jim i always put you on the spot would you like to talk about the power amp um power amp direct i would power amp direct gives the a consumer or an end user the ability to have the best possible two channel experience and the best possible multi multi channel experience in one room using the same main speakers. If we think about AVRs, which are designed to do a lot of things, there's a lot of stuff going on in an AVR. And well, we do our best. You can't make it, you know, really great for two channel and not so great for everything else. It's a balancing act. You can add, you know, a lot of people will add a two channel power amp to an AVR using the left and right main pre-outs, and now you've freed up uh, two channels of amplification you can maybe use for zone two or zone three or whatever, for additional elevation speakers or something. But you're still using the same preamp section as you are uh, when you're listening to multi-channel. With Power Amp Direct, you actually get the best of both worlds. Because in addition to adding a high quality power amp to the front stage for left and right mains, you also get a dedicated preamp that's just used for stereo listening. So the power amp direct or power amp in in this case, literally doesn't, doesn't just bypass the preamp, it literally turns the preamp off as soon as you select that input. So it becomes just a power amp. And then you turn on the AVR and it's just like adding a two channel power amp when you're listening to your multi-channel stuff. But when you're listening to two channel, you plug in your two channel sources just to the integrated amp and you don't even turn the AVR on. And now you've got a dedicated two channel system in the same room as your, as your home theater or surround system. And most of us these days, Phil, aren't like you, <laughs> where we we have the real estate in our house. Um, and let's be honest, the budget or the permission <laughs> from the decorating committee to have a two-channel rig in one room dedicated to that and a multi-channel rig in another room dedicated to that. Most of us are using double duty. And shortly in my theater, you're going to see an 8015 connected mm -hmm. to a PMKI Ruby because mm -hmm. the Model 30 is going to go up here in my office where I can look yeah. at it every day. So thank you. We love it. That's why we keep preaching about it. So let's take a look at the inside of the, the amplifier. 
So the first thing is we, the preamp section is on the opposite side of the powers of the digital power supply that drives the amplifier. Keep it as far away as possible. There is the amplifiers are located in the middle, um, the shortest path possible, cl very, very close to the speaker outputs um, for very, very short signal paths. There is a, the, a switching power supply, um, like you would see in um, um, a KI Ruby, that, that is the power supply for that powers the amplifier. Then there is a linear power supply that is used for the preamp. And then, of course, the, power, the, the preamp also utilizes HDAMs to maintain um, that warmth. Below the preamplifier, also a, um, the dedicated um, phono stage, which is look, that board is located below the, um, the preamp board on the far side of the amplifier to ensure that it is away from any um, digital circuitry. So this is the, the um, literally when I say it's two devices in one box, it is. There's a linear power supply and a preamp and a switching power supply and a power amp. So literally two separate components in the same box. So one thing about the, um, we are very, very good at these switching power supplies that are used, because like I say, we utilize them in the PM10s, the PM12 and the KI Ruby series, a lot of times when you use a switching power supply or, or an amplifier that utilizes that, the frequency response changes based on the impedance. But when you look at a Model 30, as your the impedance changes in your speakers, the frequency response stays the same, unlike many other switching um, amplifiers. So making sure that the 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 speak the amplifier um, gives you smooth, even frequency response regardless of the impedance is an important characteristic, and um, and we can do that with our with our with our amplifiers. Now it's still even though we're using a switching power supply because of the H dams and everything else that we're utilizing, you still get that warmth that is famous for Marantz. And anybody that's ever heard of Ki Ruby or a PM10 will attest to that fact. And I think um, Frederick. You said that you had kind of a comment from a um, um, a review because uh, we it's hard for me to describe it when I can let a reviewer describe it. So what what was some of the things that the person said about the sound? Yes, that's right. The thing is, it's really hard if you haven't actually heard it how to describe it. So this guy has put a little YouTube on there. I think it's Zero Fidelity if you want to look it up, mm -hmm. and he is basically reviewing the Model Thirty. Uh, what he says, so the sound presentation, just, just describe without any specificalities, just the sound, what can you expect from the Model 30. Mm -hmm. So the sound presentation is very similar to the PM8006, mm -hmm. but it's then taking to the next level because we're borrowing some legacy uh, technology that we have introduced in the PM10 and the PM12, the PMKI Ruby. Uh, so there's four aspects that he's mentioning. One is details. The second is spaciousness. The third is a sound that's energetic. And then last, easy to listen to. So what you're not going to get is this big, luscious, warm sound. You don't have a tube-like sound. It's not a distinct V curve. It's more or less linear, but with a little bit of tactical coloration here and there. So looking at detail first, the Model 30 is like a microscope into the recorded material, revealing detail that was a little bit hidden in the background, and it brings it out as if it was never meant to be hidden in the background to begin with. And it does that in a very natural way. The big spacious sound stage is no matter what speaker you connect to it, you get a boost of its ability to lay down a huge sound stage with very good focus. So if you combine these two efforts, uh, which is effortless detail and big sound stage, that's pretty much already what most audiophiles are looking for in an integrated amplifier of, of this class. So if you look at the treble, the treble is more or less neutral, if not a little bit soft sounding. So there's no sibilant sounds. You know, everyone knows if you start tweaking and with all the digital files that you have, it's been, it gets really annoying to listen to, you know, stuff like that. So that is already soft rounded. 
the mid-range is very detailed and open. It's airy, it's refined. It's not warm sounding, not trying to sound like a two amp. It's upper mid-range is prominent and a little bit forward in its nature, which helps give the sound a little bit of energy, a little bit of presence, if, if you like. So there may be a little bit of warmth in the lower mid-range, which brings us to the bass. And that's where the warmth is coming from. The bass is warm, it's strong, and it's precise. And this makes any piece of music that you throw at it much more engaging. It makes it more fun to listen to. So the Model 30 is what we call a low-level champion. So meaning that you can hear every detail in the soundstage, nice and full sounding without the need to crank it up. The tonality of this integrated amp also doesn't change when you crank up the volume like you have with AB. So you can compare it with, uh, with some uh, European sports car versus the classic American muscle car. They can both accelerate very quickly, but a lot of class AB amplifiers, once you start throwing up the volume, you crank it up, you get that muscle, you get a little bit more muscularity in there so you really need to turn it up whereas the model 30 keeps the same dynamics at a low level and when you turn up when you crank it up it just gets louder so that's typical for class d it's easy to drive so mm -hmm. it's it's a nice full sounding without the need to crank it up so mm -hmm. the tonality of this amp doesn't change as you crank up the volume so speaking of volume the volume is done with a digital volume pot meter so you don't have that gang error that analog apps amplifiers typically have where mm -hmm. if you turn it up very slowly one speaker gets louder than the other until you add a like 10 o'clock uh, level so that's pretty much in a nutshell the sound <laughs> description of what you can expect for the model 30. thank you in summary it sounds really 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 good um and that is always the goal of of these particular of these particular products. Um, the other thing he mentioned was the bass, and it is true the bass because because a lot of times when we talk about a speaker, when we say the the, the power the speakers um, have a nominal impedance. A lot of times the impedance drops at the lower frequencies where this thing delivers more power. So that's where a lot of that punch comes from when you play a pair of speakers to it. So, so a few other things we want to talk about. It has a very good um, um, phono preamp stage as well, like we said, that has that utilizes HDAM in the preamp stage, and um, and it has the ability to to choose between different input impedances. This helps it match with the different types of moving coil cartridges that are available. So, for example, we just put down a couple of examples here for those people who are who were curious about the um, the different cartridges. So for example, maybe a the, the famous Denon DL-103, you would set it to mid, something like a clear audio titanium or something like you would see on one of our Marantz, um, was it TL-15 or T-15 turntable? Um, you would maybe put it to high. You have the ability to, uh, to experiment to find the right impedance gain for the your specific cartridge. And um, so it's a very, very good phono pre-stage. Any questions, gentlemen, about the integrated amp before we go into the SA CD player? I think there was one question that was brought up by someone. Uh, why, I think it was Ashley Dio Campo, asking why are there no balanced outputs or inputs? And this is, it's easy to explain because the whole topology of this amplifier is a single-ended amplifier. And you have, uh, for example, the PM10 is a fully balanced amplifier. There it makes sense because left and right is completely independent. If you would have to add at this price point balanced connectors for inputs or outputs, you would have to have an additional circuit to go from the single-ended, convert it to balanced, and then go back to single-ended. So you would, in fact, degrade the quality of the single-ended outputs. Mm -hmm. So they've decided it doesn't make sense for this amplifier to add balanced inputs or balanced outputs. So, right. so let's, before we yes, go, sir. one more. Mm -hmm. Is the gain on the moving magnet phono input 40 dB? Yes, I'm actually is. looking at the specification sheet of the Model 30 now. So the input sensitivity for the moving magnet is 2.3 millivolts mm -hmm. and 39 
uh, kiloohms. So the moving coil has different settings. It's 250 microvolts. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 33, 100, or 309 setting. But I don't think that you can change the gain. Mm -hmm. it, you can change the impedance, but I don't think you mm -hmm. can change the gain. Exactly. Okay. Thank you, Frederick. That's why I have these guys in the um, in the wings looking up those types of specs. So let's go in and talk about the SACD slash CD player slash preamp, um, the SACD model 30N. So so let's go in and talk about this piece too. The other thing there is that symmetry again from the way the knob the um, that Simon keeps talking about. Look at the volume button and the headphone jack and the play pause um, advance. And the um, and the navigation keypad and everything is very symmetrical. You could tell that they, he really went out of his way to make sure that that actually happened. The first thing is, as somebody already brought up, the fact that it does support DSD up to 11.2. Uh, it is a CD slash SACD playback device. You can also put files on a DVD ROM. So so for example, you could put those um, 124 um, 192 slash um, um, 24 or DSD um, files onto a, instead of a USB, you can put it onto a DVD-ROM if that is more convenient and play it back using the disc, the laser drive that's built into the player. It has all the digital interfaces you would need, including Bluetooth, um, it has a HEALS capability, USB, a USB-B for asynchronous connection to a, um, a laptop, um, as well as digital ins and outs as co coax and optical. And of course, it uses Marantz's patented DDA converter, which we'll talk about in a second. And it has a very, very good headphone amplifier, which we will talk about as well. And finally, if you are someone that wants to utilize it as a preamp, because all you're using is digital sources, it has both a fixed and variable output. As I said, because of all of the capabilities of the type of disc you can play, plus all the digital, the other digital ways that you can connect it, a lot of times if you're just a person who is utilizing digital files, you could literally take that, um, the model, the uh, SACD30 and plug it directly using the variable outs into a power amp and you could skip having a second, a preamp in between. If you wanted to add analog connections, analog sources, like maybe a phonograph or a, a reel to reel, then you could, um, then that's where the preamp, you would add a preamp. But if you're just a digital file person off your computer, off the, off the, off of streaming services or off of disc, you can use this as a, a dedicated preamp. When you're playing a, a USB uh, or anything that does not require a disk to disk drive, the power supply for the disk drive system switches off to eliminate any possibility of noise. Um, anything you want to add about the disc player, Frederick? There was one question that popped up, but I think we can wait until we explain the Marantz musical mastering. Yeah. Uh, actually, you are the of master of MM of the um, of the DA converter, so I actually let you go through and talk about it because you've already started. Uh, so the whole concept is anything that's PCM is upconverted according to our own patented uh, musical mastering conversion system. So we have a stream and a conversion part. Uh, I think Ken Ishiwata at one point, because he's the brains pretty much behind the whole concept of this musical mastering, uh, Marantz musical mastering, together with Reiner Fink, one of his colleagues in the EU. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept is trying to make it sound more analog-like, because if you're using DSD, it's not the same zeros and ones that you have from PCM. If you upconvert it many more times uh, using the DSD principle, your sound will automatically be more realistic and more warm sounding than uh, than PCM. Now, there's always two camps. There are those who prefer PCM, and they will stay with playing it back natively in PCM. And then you have a camp who are into converting everything, no matter what you throw at it, into SD, into DSD to get that extra analog feel. And it works for the majority of the uh, signals that you throw at it, the majority of the music that you throw at the system, uh, because that's part of uh, our concept of Marantz. We want to have that warm, glowy, uh, detailed sound with nice dynamics. Uh, it's less analytical to that point as PCM does. So yeah, it's the 
the alternative for analog vinyl sound, so to speak. That's no. something that we're doing uniquely. So if your file is 44.1, we have a dedicated clock for all the resolutions that are 44.1 or multiples for me. If you're 48 or multiples of 48, then it is another clock. So we have two individual clocks that will upsample to DSD, either 11.2 or 12.2. Uh, we can say 12.3 if you round that up. So based mm -hmm. on the original sample rate, now we're talking about PCM here. If it is DSD, it will it will pass through as DSD and it will be upconverted. If it's, uh, for example, double DSD, it will go to quad DSD. Eventually, it will also be 11.3 or 12.3 based on the original base resolution. If you look at 12.3, that's 12 million times that you sample it. So 44.1 is only 44,100 samples per second, mm -hmm. right? So 12.3 million times is a much smoother curve. Mm -hmm. It's much closer to the original analog type of sound. So this is why when we are introducing the Moran's Musical Mastering streaming filtering process, uh, you get that typical sound that's associated with analog. So you get much closer to the actual uh, analog sound as opposed to what you get with playing pure PCM. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are two camps out there. There are certain people that prefer the sound of PCM, but then there's those that also prefer upsampling everything to DSD. And this is what Morans has chosen to go mm -hmm. that route, to go that path. The best way that somebody explain the difference between PCM to me and DSD is PCM, um, you're assigning, you're trying to, you have a certain amount of numbers that you can assign. So if I'm trying to make 56, um, I, I can assign but um, numbers by increment of three. So I can do three, say I can do three, six, nine, 12. If I'm trying to do 56, I, it's difficult to get to that number. I can go above it, I can maybe go below it. Um, DSD is basically, um, each. it's a bag of pennies. Each It's sampled over and over again, up to 11, I mean, 12 million times a second. And it's just, is it, um, and it's one bit, is it louder or is it quieter? So is it louder, 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 quieter, 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 and you end up with kind of a louder, 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 quieter, 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 and it kind of, DSD kind of follows more the way that it's sampled, the way that analog actually exists. Because analog is just, is the signal qu louder or quieter? That's what it wants to know. Um, instead of, so instead of signing me a number, is it louder or quieter? And that's kind of how DSD works. So it seems to have more of a, um, the warmth of an analog signal, which is why we picked it. Yeah, the Moran Soundmasters always thought that DSD is already analog. So just mm -hmm. adding some simple filtering, you, you get your analog sound. That's that's mm -hmm. the, the direction they went. So the streaming is the first part, conversion is the second part, and then the filtering towards the analog, it's basically converting it back to an analog output. That is the third part. And uh, a very good um, analog output stage, which I believe also utilizes HDAMs, to ensure that you get the best um, sound. Exactly, so the whole concept of the edge dam is it's not just an op amp as is, which just sounds the way it is and you can't modify the sound. So our edge dams have all these individual components in them and every single each individual component can be tweaked to tune the sounds to what uh, the sound masters have identified is the ideal typical Moran sound. So this is something we're doing different. We can completely tweak and tune the sound to to the point where we think, okay, now it has achieved for this particular use application because they're used in different places. They're used as mm -hmm. filters, they're used in phono stage, they're used in the output stage as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see the board looks, separate, um, looks different. One side is the variable side um, the, and one side is the fixed side. So you can see uh, that you actually, it's kind of, I think that's kind of cool. Um, the next thing, headphone amplifier has a really good headphone amplifier. One of the first things that I got when I moved, when I came to um, uh, Marantz is a pair of, uh, let me grab them. Uh, these are um, my favorite headphones. These are the 9200s. Is it D9200s? And I absolutely love these. They're handmade in Japan. And I that was one of the very first things that I got. I think Frederick has a pair and Jim has a pair. And I think Frederick was nice enough to see, was in Japan to see his made. 
which is actually pretty, pretty cool. And, um, <laughs> yes, it's, name it's right there behind me, number 18. If you look at the videos, it also says serial number number 18, which is apparently a lucky number for Asia. Yeah, yeah. Yuppie. Yeah. <laughs> you sucker, I'm not sure what my serial number is. But yeah, but these are these are handmade in Japan, and the quality is exceptional. And Absolutely. when you have a very good headphone amplifier, it makes a difference. So having um, and so these sound spectacular on um on the on the model on the SACD um 30N. The fact that you have different gains for the headphones, so you can go in and and adjust the gain to find the the best quality. Uh, most headphone amplifiers on most of the devices you plug into are fixed. I mean, they're not fixed volume, they're fixed gain. So when I turn the receiver up, of course, the volume is going to go up and go down. It's just, it, this is just the fixed gain is how much power do I put through those, ham through those um, um, headphones as I turn the volume up and the volume down. So the volume is variable. It's not, it's not fixed at one volume on on the amplifier it's just the gain how when i turn the volume knob how much gain is applied is fixed so yes, hopefully Phil, and it's 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 all based on the impedance of the headphone used if you have a low impedance amplifier it, you won't need to set up the gain it will play mm -hmm. fine and you can just use the volume to turn it up it's when you have high impedance professional headphones or the high end grade uh headphones with a high impedance that mm -hmm. even if you turn up the volume, you won't have it enough gain. That's where you need it. Yeah. That's where <laughs> yeah. you turn it up. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's what happens if you go out and get a really, really good set of headphones and you plug them into a receiver and you just and you turn it all the way up and it's it's still not loud enough. Um, that tells you that you need more gain. Um, with this unit, what I did was I plugged my 9200s in it and I started playing music. And I when I played on low, it played fine. It, there was enough volume to get to where I wanted. When I went to mid, I had a little bit more gain. And that's more gain. I got more punch in my bass. And I could write, and the volume knob could be turned down. I could have went to high, but I didn't see a reason to it to do so. So, because um, I wanted more, I guess, um, adjustability with my volume um, by leaving it in mid. So I left, so I put it in mid, gave me punchier bass, and I had, and I got, I can get the volume that I want with the volume not being above, not having to be above halfway. So, so that's why I picked um, I picked mid. Do we have time for one last question? Uh, yes. Manoj wants to know if we are going to see the new Marantz look spread to the AV receivers. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is yes. Uh, we Ooh. call this internally project continuity. Mm -hmm. So we started with these two two channel uh, products, and eventually mm -hmm. all the new products from Marantz that will be released in the future will gradually be replaced yes. with the new look, the new yeah. look and feel. Yes. So the yes. same, same sound, same traditional sound, new look with all the products. Yes. So thank you guys again for coming. So take care and we will talk to you soon.